So today's video is going to be a Crested Gecko Care Guide. Now you know I don't do care guides for animals until I've owned them for at least a year and I'm fully confident in my care of them. That's why I only have like three care guides up right now. I think I have an Iguana Care Guide, a Corn Snake Care Guide, and a Kenyan Sand Boa Care Guide. Out of all my animals, those are the only care guides I have up right now because like I said, I wait a whole year at least before trying to educate others on how to care for them. Cause I wanna make sure that I am fully confident in what I'm doing. So one of the animals I've had for definitely over a year now is my Crested Gecko Pip. So it's time for a Crested Gecko Care Guide. And I do own two Crested Geckos now. I have Pip, my tricolored Harlequin Dalmatian, who I got from a breeder at an expo, and my new one, who doesn't have a name yet, but he is a partial Dalmatian, and that's all I really know about him. Um, he was from a rescue situation that got rehomed, adopted by me. Um, basically, he's got his own video, so I'm not getting into that, but he didn't come from a breeder. Um, but he doesn't have a name yet, and I don't really know his morph yet. Um, at the time that this video goes up, maybe I will. Who knows? Anyway, I've got two now. Um, and yeah, so you'll probably get to see both of them throughout this video. But to start off, I'm going to go get Pip because she doesn't really like to be handled. So she probably won't be out very long and I'll have to put her away. And then I'll go get the other one because he's much better with handling. So this is Pip. She is starting to get pretty big. For a while there, I was getting concerned because I felt like she wasn't really growing. But she's definitely gotten a lot bigger and kind of chunky <laughs> and definitely a lot more jumpy. You know, we were doing good. She was calming down and now she's kind of getting jumpy again, but we're working on it. But yeah, so that is Pip. She is fired down right now, so her colors aren't quite as crazy. But she's a good girl and she's very pretty. And as you can see, she does still have a tail. So we'll talk about tails in a little bit. But let's go back to the beginning. So like I said, they are crested geckos. They are called crested geckos because they have these little eyelashes or crests that make it look like they have eyelashes. So it goes all along their eyes and their head and down their back. So the crested gecko is a lizard species or gecko species from New Caledonia, which are these little islands where it doesn't get too, too hot. Um, they are an arboreal species of gecko, as you can tell by the sticky feet. So they do live up in the trees. And they are one of the best beginner reptiles. So for anyone that wants a reptile, but they've never had one before, crested geckos are the ones that I hands down recommend as your first one. Because in my opinion, they're the easiest reptile to care for. Pip and No Name are my easiest reptiles to care for. So obviously, just to start off, you can't have an animal and know where to put it. So we're gonna start off talking about enclosures. So like any animal, the enclosure size depends on the size of the animal. So the smaller the animal, or the smaller the gecko, the younger the gecko, the smaller the enclosure can be. So for a young gecko or a juvenile, I recommend something like a 10 gallon turned so it's tall, or a 12 by 12 by 18 exoterra, which is what I personally use. You can see, oh, you can't see. Hmm. Up there, up there in the corner. Up, up, up there in the corner. I can't point to it when I have a gecko in my hands, but way over there. Um, 
Pip is currently in a 12 by 12 by 18 while I work on her new enclosure, which is a 20 gallon long turned sideways. So that leads me into an adult gecko. So an adult crested gecko is much bigger than a juvenile or a baby and they need a bigger enclosure. So in this case, you want an 18 by 18 by 24 exoterra or a 20 gallon long tank turned so it's vertical. And that is what I'm currently in the process of working on for Pip. It is like halfway done. And then soon I'll be working on one for the new guy too because he's a little bigger than her so he does need a 20 gallon tank. Um, but he's currently in Yeti's old, oop. But he's currently in an extra 12 by 12 by 18 tank that I have um, until that happens. So it is possible to house more than one crested gecko together. Um, however, of course, the more geckos you have in an enclosure, the bigger the enclosure needs to be. Um, so I won't speak on that too much because I don't have experience housing multiple crested geckos together. But I will say you do not want to house more than one male. You don't want to put two males together because that will end badly. Um, if you put a male and a female together, be prepared for babies or eggs at least. Um, so definitely take some consideration before housing more than one gecko together and do your research. But that's all I'm going to say on the subject because I have not housed more than one gecko together. So overall, the most important thing to keep in mind when deciding on an enclosure for a crested gecko is that height is the most important thing because they are arboreal. They live up in the trees. So you don't want a tank that's really long and short. You want a tank that has more height. Um, so something that they can definitely feel like they're climbing up in and getting high up in. That is the most important thing for these guys. Okay, so now before we talk about what goes on inside of the enclosure, we're going to talk about lights and temperature. So what makes these geckos an ideal beginner pet reptile is that a lot of people think they don't require any sources of heat or UVB. A lot of people argue that they do perfectly fine at room temperature. Now, there is some contradicting thoughts to this, some conflicting thoughts, and people don't really agree. Some people argue that you do want to provide a heat source to create a gradient, because in the wild, they would have a gradient available to them. It keeps them healthy. One stable temperature may increase the likelihood of being lethargic or illnesses or whatnot. Um, so there's a lot of different thoughts on this. So really, you just have to, first of all, like I always say, do all of your research. Do your own research. Don't use this video as your only source of information. Use it as one of your sources of information. Compare what I say to other sources and then make a decision for yourself based on what you want to follow. Everything I say in my care guides is what I personally do with my animals. Someone else might do something differently. So definitely look at everything. So from a zoology standpoint and a naturalistic standpoint, I see where people are coming from with providing a source of heat. Now I have done both. When I first got Pip, I did have a ceramic heat emitter on her, mainly because we were going into winter and the apartment I lived in in college it was very cold. I didn't really get heat to my bedroom very well. Um, so I did give her a source of heat. Now I'm in my own apartment with a very good heat system. And, you know, we just finished summer. It's just now starting to get cold. So currently she stays at room temperature, uh, which is how most people keep their crested geckos. They keep them at room temperature. Um, so that is what I have been doing with her. However, going to winter, I will probably give her a ceramic heat emitter again or some sort of external heat um, just for the daytime to create a gradient. So I've kind of been playing around with both, trying to decide what I prefer to do and what I think um, is most beneficial. Can you get out of my hair? Okay, so as far as temperatures, like I said, they tend to do well at room temperature. They really don't have the temperature requirements that many reptiles have. So the warmest you want for the like hot spot in the enclosure is between like 80 and 85 degrees. You really don't want any higher and you don't want the whole enclosure to be at this temperature because too hot of an enclosure for a crested gecko can create unnecessary stress 
and can lead to problems due to the heat, too much heat, because these the species is used to cooler temperatures. So 80 to 85 is the warmest that you should go in a basking area. Now the cool temperatures and temperatures in the rest of the enclosure can range between like 70 to 75, you know, mid 70s is a really good temperature for these guys, which is why a lot of people keep them at room temperature. Now at night, they can stand a little bit of a drop, which also makes them a very easy reptile to keep because you don't have to worry about keeping them hot at night. So at night, they can drop down to mid 60s, about 65. Not completely ideal, but they can do it, which is why, again, a lot of people don't provide them with heat because in your house, it usually stays between 65 and 75 at least. So usually they're pretty good. But like I said, creating a gradient for them makes it more naturalistic and a lot of people think benefits their health. So if you would like to add a source of heat for your gecko, I highly recommend ceramic heat emitters because they give off no light. Crested geckos are crepuscular or nocturnal, so they come out and they're active at nighttime. So their eyes are very well adept to see in the dark without help from lighting and adding any heat bulbs that give off light can actually mess with their circadian rhythms and their sleep patterns and can create stress. So you want something that can give off heat without the light, which is what a ceramic heat emitter does. So I personally love ceramic heat emitters for adding a source of heat. Also, she is fired up now. So you can see those colors a little bit better. You can see those Dalmatian spots a little bit. So now that we've talked about temperature, we're going to go back to lighting. So like I said, some people think they need UVB and some people don't. Um, they survive without UVB because like I said, they are crepuscular or nocturnal and they spend all day hiding out in the leaves and then come out at night when it's dark. So I don't really get too much sun exposure. However, there's really no downside to giving an animal UVB. It can only increase their health. So there are low UVB bulbs that you can give to a crested gecko. You don't want anything that's too high in UVB because that can be damaging. It's not what the species is used to. But there are UVBs designated for species like crested geckos, like the Arcadia Shade Dweller. That's a good UVB bulb for a low exposure um, to UVB. So that is what I would recommend looking into if you want to provide UVB to your crested gecko is the Arcadia Shade Dweller, which once I get her new enclosure up and running, I do want to look into getting for her. Because, you know, I want to check it out. I want my animals to be as healthy as possible and live in as much naturalistic exhibits or enclosures as I can provide for them. So you can also add daytime bulbs. If you're not doing UVB, you can add daytime bulbs to create a day and night cycle. Day and night cycles are really good for your animals. It keeps them healthy, it keeps it natural. And my go-to is 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime. So that's about the average for providing daylight to your animals. However, you can adjust that based on summer and winter hours if you want it to be as natural as possible. I personally just stick to a 12-12 um, light cycle, but you know, research and do what you want to do. For her, I don't have an extra light to create a light cycle because I have light coming through the windows in my house. So she knows when it's daytime and when it's not daytime. But again, once her new enclosure is up and running, these are all things I'm going to be revisiting. All right, so now we're gonna talk about what goes on inside the enclosure, starting with substrate. So there's a few different substrates you can use for a crested gecko. Um, I personally use organic topsoil with moss, it's so like peat moss. Um, so that's really good, it's very naturalistic, it holds humidity well. Um, you can also use bioactive substrates, such as the bioactive supplies from Josh's Frogs, or the bio, is it bio bedding from the bio dude? The uh, one you want from bio dude would be the terra fauna, which I'm looking into for her next enclosure because her enclosure upgrade that I'm working on right now is a bioactive setup. So there will be a video on that. Um, so I am looking into the different substrates for bioactive setups to decide what it is I want to use. A lot of people also use things like reptosoil or eco earth. Um, however, I don't really use 
any of those kind of reptile soils anymore since I've started using organic topsoil. Um, so if you are interested in learning a little bit more about the organic topsoil or hearing me talk about it a little more, I did recently put out a video on my, I think it was like 10 money saving tips for reptile keepers and that was one of them. So I talk about it a little bit more there and I believe in the comments I do talk about which ones are best, but I'll probably add it in the description as well um, so people can refer to that. But yeah, so I use organic topsoil. A lot of people also use paper towels because it makes for really easy cleanup and it's especially good for new geckos when they're going through a quarantine period because you can monitor their poops and whatnot to make sure that they are pooping and that they look healthy. So what you want to avoid are substrates with large particles that they could potentially ingest and choke on. So things like cypress bark you want to avoid. You also want to avoid things like reptile carpets. I don't know why they still sell those. Reptile carpets are so gross because they just collect bacteria and nastiness and just don't get a reptile carpet, just don't. Okay, so now this species also requires a little bit of a higher humidity, which is very easily obtained just by spraying them down. And this is where a naturalistic substrate definitely helps because it helps trap that humidity and keep the enclosure humid for longer, or higher humidity. Um, so they want about 50 to 80% humidity. So spraying in the morning and at the nighttime will help you keep that humidity up. Now you wanna be careful that you're not oversaturating the enclosure because that's asking for mold and mildew to grow, which can be very harmful to your gecko's health. So you want it to be able to dry out a little bit before you spray it down again, but you don't want it to drop below 50%. Now spraying down is also very helpful because the crested geckos will drink the water that lands on like leaves and whatnot and on the glass. So it's a good source of water for them that they can drink. Now when you're decorating your enclosure, you want to make sure that there's plenty of hiding places for them and horizontal climbing spaces. So naturally, because they have little sticky toes, they're very good at climbing and they'll climb the glass and whatnot, which is very vertical. So you wanna provide horizontal places for them to climb because if they stay vertical, because all they can do is just sit vertically, they do run the risk of things like floppy tail syndrome. So you want to provide lots of different climbing opportunities that allows them to be at different levels in their enclosure as far as their how their body is situated. <laughs> so I personally have like suction cup plants that are very full. So it really fills the space, gives her a place to hide or climb in and bamboo suction cup extendy bars so they fit lots of different sized enclosures because they can push in and out and they have suction cups at the end i absolutely love them i got them for her for christmas last year and i will link all this stuff in the description below um so everything that i talk about in this video i will put in a list on my amazon it's like a crusted gecko care list or something and I will link that in the description below. So you can just click that link and everything that I've mentioned will be right there in one list for you guys. So she's been really, really good. So I'm gonna put her away while she's being really good and get out the other guy um, and finish the video with him because I want him to be able to be in this video too. Okay, so now that Pip is away and he's out, we're gonna talk about diets. For so another thing that makes these guys so easy to care for is that you can go right to the store and buy a nutritionally complete packaged diet for them where you wouldn't want to go to the pet store and buy a packaged diet for a bearded dragon or an iguana because that's not good for them in fact a lot of the iguana ones have animal protein in them which is not good for green iguanas um packaged diets for crusty geckos are spot on and are so good for them as long as you're getting like a high quality, good brand. So I recommend Pangea and Rapashi. Those are like the two most common ones that people use in my opinion, and the only ones that I use. Um, I personally use a lot of Pangea. And it's awesome because they come in all different flavors, so you can get different flavors. Mind you, some Crested Geckos are a little picky and have preferences. Um, my Crested Geckos could care less and they like anything I give them, so I got very lucky. So basically it's like a little powder that you mix with water until it's like a ketchup consistency. And then you just put it in a little bowl for them 
and you can get like suction cup feeders that go up on the side of the enclosure um, because these guys are arboreal they would much rather prefer to eat higher up than on the ground so you can get things like this that suction cups the side of the wall and have a spot to put your dishes in um, this one in particular has two so i can do a little dish for water and a little dish for food um, now a lot of people think that crested geckos won't drink from a water bowl it's, there's no harm in offering one to see sometimes they do um, and they also come with one hole so pip has a butterfly one in hers only has one hole this one has two holes now on top of these powdered foods um, it's also a good idea to offer live insects about once a week. Um, you, know, you don't need to have their diet totally 100% consist of these. Um, live insects can make them kind of fat, um, but they're really good for adding a little bit of fat to the diet and helping young geckos grow. So there's some contradiction on how much you should feed, like how often during the week you should feed. So there's some contradiction on how often during the week you should feed live insects, but I usually go for about once a week. So live insects, good ones to be crickets, dubia roaches, black soldier fly larvae because they're high in calcium. Because um, crested geckos can, believe it or not, also get metabolic bone disease as much as they don't really need UVB. Um, they can get metabolic bone disease if not enough, they don't get enough calcium. So a good powder diet like Pangea or Apache and dusted insects like dubia roaches or crickets or black soldier fly larvae which are very high in calcium and don't require dusting. So for young geckos you want to feed them every 24 hours so like every day and for older geckos you can usually do every other day. Um, now you probably won't see them eat but you can tell by whether or not they're defecating. And you can always look in the little food dish to see how much Pangea or Apache or whatever they ate. You can tell when there's some missing. Now one more note on the live food. It is a good idea to add in live food because it gives them the opportunity to exercise and hunt for these animals or bugs and use kind of those natural instincts of hunting. So it's very good enrichment for them to offer once a week. Just like I say with all animals, especially the iguanas, you want to have a variety. It gets boring eating the same thing all the time. So throwing in the occasional bugs or mixing up your flavors of Pangea. I usually have two Pangeas going at a time so I can switch between flavors to mix it up for them a little bit. So now we're going to talk about handling. So as you have been able to watch this whole video how I handle them, they're a little bit jumpy. Crested geckos do like a free fall. If you think about in the wild, if they were to leap, they would probably get caught by a branch or some leaves. So it's just kind of part of their makeup is having this thought that if they just jump away from danger, something's gonna catch them. In captivity, it doesn't really work. If I'm standing in the middle of my room and they jump, they're gonna go to, to the floor. And sometimes they do it when you're least expecting it. So Pip has done that to me a lot. He hasn't, but Pip does that to me all the time. I'm not expecting it. All of a sudden she leaps. So you have to keep that in mind. You know, once you handle them a lot, they do calm down quite a bit. So as you can see, he's pretty calm. He's been doing a little more leaping today than he has been. Um, usually he's very, very calm. But as you can see, I'm also doing this thing that I call treadmilling. So I just keep my hands going and he just keeps going my hands. So it looks like he's going to jump but then I insist that he goes on my other hand, so just keeps him going so that he doesn't jump. Of course, I uh, failed at that moment in time. But it can also help because sometimes if they jump, you can catch them with that other hand. So that's very helpful if they're going away from you, where he was going towards me. So if he jumps, he's landing on me, so it's not a big deal. Now, my rule of thumb when handling nocturnal animals is I handle them during the daytime because that's when they're kind of the sleepiest and they're not quite as alert and awake, so they're easier to handle. So it's easier to work with them and gain their trust because they're not totally like wide awake. Um, so this is the middle of the night for them, so it makes it much easier to handle them. Now, before we finish, I'm going to talk about tails and their lifespan, starting with lifespan. So reptiles are not a short-lived pet. 
Most of them will live to be about 20, including crested geckos. A healthy crested gecko could live to be about 20 years old. So you want to make sure you're committed to that long lifespan. If you think you are ready to have a gecko for 20 years, then by all means, go for it. But if you don't think you're gonna want an animal for 20 years and you're gonna get sick of it, then a reptile like a crested gecko probably is not for you. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about before we wrap up is their tail. So as you can see, he doesn't have a tail. He is a frog butt where Pip did have a tail. So crested geckos, like a lot of reptiles or like a lot of lizards, can drop their tails. Now, they can do this for many reasons. They can do it because they're scared, but they can also do it for God knows what reason. I've heard people having their crested geckos drop their tail because they turned on the vacuum, even though they've been vacuuming for years. All of a sudden, the vacuum was scary and they dropped their tail. Some people have woken up in the middle of the night and their gecko just doesn't have a tail anymore. So there's really no rhyme or reason to a crested gecko dropping its tail. They can just one day just drop their tail. Now, unlike other lizards, crested geckos do not grow back their tail. Um, however, this lack of tail, they adapt fine without it. It's not life-threatening. As you can see, he's totally fine. He heals right up and he gets around fine. It takes some adjusting, some getting used to, of course, but they can function and do totally fine without it. So if your crested gecko drops its tail, there's no reason to panic. That's totally common. It will heal and he will get over it or she, your gecko will get over it and be okay. The only thing that I would suggest doing that I would personally do if my gecko dropped its tail is remove the substrate and put in paper towel just until it's completely, just until, just until it's completely healed and good again. So I don't have any experience with geckos dropping their tails. He came to me without a tail. So obviously you don't really know what to do until it happens. But that's just personally what I would do. I would take out any dirt and put in paper towel so it's a nice, clean, sterile environment until he's good to go. So that is everything for this video. That is my Crested Gecko Care Guide. I hope some of you found that helpful or useful. Don't forget, everything I talked about will be linked in the description if you want to go and buy any of the things that I personally use or told you about. Um, that will all be in the description below. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'm always looking at my comments, um, checking for updates and whatnot. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments for me so I can get back to them. And don't forget to do more research other than just this video. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you don't miss out on more videos. And we'll see you for the next one. Bye.